Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the strength of our ancestors, the host of this meal, the builder of the city that is to come. Amen. If we have died with Christ, we will also live with Christ. So let us confess our sin to the one who is faithful, the one with whom we die, the one in whom we come alive. God, our helper, we confess the many ways we have failed to live as your disciples. We have not finished what we began. We have feasted with friends but ignored strangers. We have been captivated by our possessions. Lift our burdens, gracious God. Refresh our hearts and forgive our sin. Raise us to the new life you have chosen for us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. There is rejoicing in heaven when sinners repent. Put your trust in these promises. God will never leave you or forsake you. You who were lost have been found. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Rejoice with the angels at this good news. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Word of God, word of life. A reading from Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and it is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one 
who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, very, I, very truly I tell you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise it's Reformation Sunday that most Lutheran of liturgical celebrations. On this day, we remember our heritage of faith, and we thank God for the witness of Martin Luther and other reformers who called the church to a renewed appreciation of God's free grace received by faith in Jesus Christ. Most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the history of the 16th century Reformation. If you're not and you want to learn more, um, I recommend Eric Metaxas's excellent biography of Luther, and I do have a copy I can lend out if anybody would like to borrow that. My sermon this morning incorporates slides both from my own trip to Luther's Germany and from the faithful ministry of Trinity today. There are some prominent symbols and images commonly associated with the Reformation. Of course, there's Martin Luther himself that former monk who rediscovered the truth of the gospel by studying passages like our second reading that Deborah read from Romans today. We also think of the corrupt practice of indulgences sold by the Church of Luther's Day as a monetary transaction for salvation. And we remember the door of the castle church in Wittenberg where Luther nailed his 95 theses condemning all those practices that robbed Christians of the freedom Christ promises in today's gospel. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. There's Luther's seal, a black cross set on a red heart surrounded by a white road and a field of blue, symbolizing God's promise that we read from Jeremiah, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. These are some of the historic symbols of the Reformation. But the Reformation is more than an historic event. This morning I want to focus on four gifts of the Reformation that continue to strengthen and inform our lives today. First is our Lutheran understanding of the Word of God. In Luther's day, God's word was the treasure of the church hierarchy. With no printing presses, Bibles were the possession of the elite. Worship and preaching were conducted in Latin, the language of church leaders and academics. Common Christians were actually discouraged from reading the Bible. Luther himself didn't even see his first Bible until he was 20 years old. A key to the Reformation was Luther's insistence that God's word must be open to all of God's people. And he encouraged us to think of that word in three ways. First of all, the word of God is Jesus Christ, the ultimate expression of God's will and being. St. John writes that the word became flesh and lived among us. It is this incarnate word who was crucified to destroy the power of sin and death, and who rose on the third day 
to give us eternal life, peace, and joy. It is around his cross and resurrection that we gather as God's people. And it is this living word that stands behind all our other expressions of God's word. Second, God's word is the preached or proclaimed word. Whether it's spoken from this pulpit at Luther's University Church in Wittenberg, or preached from our own pulpit, or proclaimed by our young people on a summer mission trip, God's word continues to be incarnate in the lives of Christ's people as we speak to each other about the grace that we know in Jesus Christ. Finally, Luther said that God's word is embodied in the Holy Scriptures. He translated the Bible into the language of the people, leading to a rich heritage of translation in languages familiar to us. He encouraged the study of Scripture, not just among the elite or the clergy, but among all God's people. As a professor, he promoted the highest scholarship in pursuit of the truth of the gospel, never afraid to let God's word be understood in new and fresh ways relevant to the world in which we live. But scholarship alone would never replace devotional reading. Luther spent hours a day in prayer and meditation on the scripture, a discipline that continues to strengthen our lives of faith. An understanding of God's word is the first gift of the Reformation. Whenever we come together around that word, this gift of the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, and enlightens us in faith. A second gift of the Reformation is Luther's understanding of the sacraments. In the Reformer's day and continuing to our time, the Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments. Baptism, Confirmation, Holy Communion, Confession, Marriage, Holy Orders, and the Anointing of the Sick. While Luther highly valued and encouraged all of these practices, he argued that a true sacrament must be understood as God's way of freely giving Christ to his people. It is not something we do, he said, like confirmation, or something for a particular subset of Christians like marriage or ordination. Therefore, Luther emphasized two sacraments, and he was a little iffy on confession. Um, sometimes he included it, sometimes he didn't. Um, but those two sacraments are holy baptism and holy communion, reminding us that it is God's work, God's grace, God's command, and God's love through Jesus Christ that grant us salvation. In, bap in baptism, we are united with Christ and made members of his church, his body, called to share his mission of forgiveness, justice, righteousness, and love. In communion, we are fed with the body and blood of our Lord, given and shed for our forgiveness and strength. For as he lives in us, we live in him. A third gift of the Reformation is Luther's recognition of the holiness of relationships and an acknowledgement of the priesthood of all believers. In Luther's time, and still in some churches today, priests could not marry. We know that, although I read that the bishops just approved um, married deacons um, in the Amazon being um, eligible for ordination to the priesthood. Um, but the priesthood was seen in Luther's day as a higher calling, as something which should not be tainted by loyalty to family. But an early principle of the Reformation was the sanctity of all vocations. So Luther married Katrina von Bora, whose likeness still bustles through the garden at the Luther home in Wittenberg. A former nun, an astute businesswoman, a loving mother, and a partner in prayer and faith, Katie became a model for people who hold multiple vocations in faith and service toward God. In their home, 
Martin and Katie received guests, raised their family, and discussed what it means to be called by God. At this table, Luther translated the Hebrew scriptures, but it was also the place of family meals and conversations, a calling he held in equally high esteem. We are not all called to be pastors, priests, or deacons, but we are all given holy callings to bear Christ's love in our home, our schools, our workplaces, our communities, and in the other relationships God has given us. The last gift of the Reformation that we'll consider today is the gift of music. Hiding from his enemies in the mighty fortress of the Wartburg Castle, Luther composed the Reformation's most enduring hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Even though Lutherans have no monopoly on the music of faith, our heritage has enriched the music of all God's people. The Lutheran love of music inspired Johann Sebastian Bach, who was sometimes called the composer of the Reformation and in other times the fifth evangelist for the way his music conveys the truth and grace of the gospel. Great organs still praise our God and enliven the worship of God's people. Brass bands sound forth Christ's glory. Handbells ring the Savior's love. Choirs, piano, percussion, and strings sing of God's grace. For we have had God's word written on our hearts. We have been saved by grace through faith. We have been set free by the power of the gospel. And praise springs forth from our hearts. These gifts of the Reformation are ours, but they are not ours alone. They are gifts of God for the whole church and for all of God's creation. It is our joy to be strengthened in these gifts for service in Christ's name. It is our privilege to recognize these gifts, not only here among Lutherans, but among all of God's people. It is our calling to share Christ's love in all we do. And it is God's grace that even now joins our voices with the choir of heaven as we sing praises to God's holy name. Thanks be to God. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing the one in whom we trust, and with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our refuge and strength, you make all things new. Reform your church so that our life together bears witness to your unmerited love. Free us from sin and write the law of love on our hearts. We ask your blessing on our partners in ministry, Christ Episcopal and Father John, St. Mark's and their minister, Doug, our Lutheran pantries and those they serve, for Trinity Deaf and D, and Common Ground, Pastor Tom and Emily. Lord, in your mercy. Our Reform our relationships with you, with one another, and with all creation. Restore this good earth, the home you entrust to our care. Enrich soils, cleanse waters, and purify the air. 
Lord, in your mercy. Bring an end to war and to the violence that shakes the nations and worries your people. When voices of fear threaten to overwhelm us, fill the earth with your peace and strength. Lord, in your mercy. Be the present help of those suffering the tumult of illness, poverty, abandonment, and uncertainty. Bring your calm and healing to those in need, especially Chris, Al, Kristen, Marion, Harry, Christine, and David. Lord, in your mercy. In this community, O Lord, we are all both saints and sinners. In our dealings with one another and in our witness in the world, help us trust in your mercy, freely offering others what you give us. Lord, in your mercy. We remember before you those who have died in Christ and now live in the fullness of salvation. We trust your presence now, even as we wait for your glory to be revealed. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting and delighting in you, we commend all our lives into your loving hands. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also, and also with, you. with you. Again, I welcome all of you to worship today. It's good to be here. We have um, our November steeple notes available to you now, so please take that. There are some important announcements in there, some good events coming up, some um, status reports on, on the church's financial situation. Please do read that and um, pray for the ministries of Trinity. Um, all Saints Sunday is next week. Today is technically the deadline to bring in any photos you have of those who have gone before us to heaven. Um, if you forgot today and you want to bring one, um, bring it to the office tomorrow by noon and we should be, and we should be okay on that. Um, by noon on Thursday, Halloween day, is the day that we need any names that you would like included in the prayers and candle lighting of those who have died within the last year, so since last November. And you can just call the church office on that or email it in. There is no mission and service committee meeting today because of Marion's illness. And next Sunday, I remind you all to sleep in an extra hour. It's the day we turn the clocks back. So um, get that extra sleep from, um, with extra energy to worship next week on All Saints Sunday. Let us now worship God with our offering. Let us pray. God, our provider, we bring nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it except the gifts you have first given us, which we bring to your table and with them the offering of our lives. Nourish us now with the life that really is life, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our prayers and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. Come, take your place at the feast. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of blessing, at this table we have seen you face to face, and in the gift of Christ's body and blood, our hearts have been refreshed. Send us now to shine with your goodness and bear witness to the one we have received. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Guard the good treasure given to you by the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Almighty God bless you with grace, mercy, and peace, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Live in love as Christ has loved us. Thanks be to God.